morning, guys. Good morning. One second, my volume's really low. Okay, it's 1030 and um, we're going to get started with our next session. Um, my name is Debbie Collins Maskell and I've been. Um, oh, Christine, can you put your video on? Christine? Oh, okay. I can. Okay. I can see your notes. Okay. Again, well, um, I'm Debbie Collins Maskell. I'm part of the planning committee. Um, I have been a social worker for almost 40 years and I've been part of this committee uh, for the past two years. Um, today we're going to have um, a discussion and with Dr. Christine Pun and Dr. Haley Moore. Um, Dr. Christine Pun completed her MD at the University of Toronto and Family Medicine Residency in Cape Britain, Nova Scotia. Her clinical experience includes hospital emergency department and inpatient care, cancer center, palliative symptom management clinic, hospice and home-based care in both tertiary academic center and rural communities. Dr. Pun is the Ontario Health Northeast Regional Palliative Care Physician Lead and an Associate Professor at NOSM. Dr. Haley Moore is a palliative care physician working independently in the region of North Bay and Sudbury. She completed her family medicine residency at Northern Ontario School of Medicine and her PGY3 in palliative care from the University of Ottawa. Both of these physicians are passionate about the advancement of person-centered decision-making and palliative care education. So again, I would just remind everybody to keep their microphones on mute and I will be looking for the questions through the chat. And so at the end of their presentation, uh, we will have a time for discussion and for questions. And as we mentioned before, if we do not get to all the questions, they will be answered uh, by the physicians and available by next Friday. So Christine, I'm going to turn my mic off and let you take it away. Thank you. Debbie. Are you seeing the presentation okay? Yes, we are. Yeah, and you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Sounds good, because I do tend to mumble, so um, let me know if I need to speak up a little bit more. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, it is kind of tough following Eugene's really powerful presentation. Um, I know there's so much in that presentation that resonated with me, and I do realize that I, I'm coming to you with a lot of baggage after going through the last few years of the pandemic as a merge dog and um, taking on the, the palliative care uh, regional lead role. So at times I'm, I do feel like I'm kind of barely keeping myself together um, when I see all that healthcare needs that are really, really so high around us. So, I mean, again, thank you for um, all that you do because I think, you know, it is the team approach that has been kind of keeping us all together. And I'm also really thankful for Eugene to uh, have all these suggested tools so that we can actually use. Um, so in thinking about how I can reconcile, like, you know, all that's going through my mind right now after the last talk, um, I know that I will have to kind of spend a lot more time really just reflecting on things. But meanwhile, I think for this talk, I'm going to default back to my usual stretch, stress management role. So. As some of you know, like when I feel stressed, I kind of tend to want to go into action mode. So I kind of just go and kind of start making plans. So I'd like to think that we have a plan to address um, all, any of the things that we can actually do something about. So this is why we were bringing this talk to you. Hopefully um, this talk will give you a bit of that sense of the plan that we have, at least for our regional palliative care program. And, um, I hope that this talk with Dr. Moore will give you like a little bit of direction in your work and life as we are continuing to adjust to our new environment that we find ourselves in um, in the like three years um, into the pandemic. So here's our disclosure slide um, for Dr. Moore and myself. So specifically, I do want to mention that um, my colleagues um, on the regional palliative care leadership team at Ontario Health Northeast have helped me a great deal with uh, the preparation of today's uh, talk in the slide deck. Um, 
I'll also be presenting, um, so I'll be presenting material about the Northeast Pelican Network that I've been privy to as the regional clinical co-lead. Uh, co and uh, my hope is to be able to share that with you, especially uh, to my regional partners, but to really, really all the audience, um, so that you have an update of the changes related to the administrative structure and leadership, uh, provincially and regionally, and that you feel connected with us and that uh, we can all look to forward together to broaden our reach. So our learning objectives today include um, discussing the recent development in our provincial and regional palliative care network, identifying priorities for palliative care in our region, and then uh, Dr. Moore will go into applying tools to identify patients um, who can benefit from a palliative care approach to care and sharing some tips for early in initiation of palliative care approach to care. So let's start with talking about our regional and provincial palliative care network. So a lot of you are probably aware of um, the OPCN, um, the Ontario Palliative Care Network, was launched in March of 2016, and it's a partnership uh, funded by the Ministry of uh, Health and Long-Term Care, and it was initially led by Cancer Care Ontario, um, the LIN at that point, um, Health Quality Ontario, and the Quality Hospice uh, Palliative Care Coalition of Ontario. It was formed to bring together um, community stakeholders, health services providers, and health system planners in order to develop a coordinated and standardized approach for delivering hospice palliative care services in the province. So with the establishment of Ontario Health in June of 2019 by the government of Ontario, the OPC and uh, Secretariat, which was originally housed under Cancer Care Ontario, became part of Ontario Health. So the OPC and Secretariat and the Provincial Palliative Care Program now works with Ontario Health leadership to continue to set strategic properties, oh, sorry, strategic priorities, and leads the execution of OPCN's mandate and priorities. Um, it's providing operational support to the Oversight Council, the Planning and Performance Council, and the um, other working groups and tables, and it works with Ontario health regions who hold the relationship with health services providers to implement the prov provincial priorities. So, with the formation of the Ontario Health, um, our previous LINs, um, which were LIN 13 and LIN 14 for Northeastern and Northwestern Ontario, are now known as Ontario Health Northeast Region and Ontario Health Northwest. So this has actually worked for us really well because instead of having to merge various lens like is happening in other regions in Ontario, we have pretty much remained whole during the whole transition. So, um, but one of the key things that we want to remember about Northern Ontario is that although we only account for 5.5% of the population, we're pretty widespread over 80% of the province land mass. So as such, um, Northeastern Ontario and Northwestern Ontario share a lot of the same characteristics and challenges that are quite different from Southern Ontario. And this slides kind of show the Ontario Health Regional Leadership Structure that has been formed, or that's been formed, and it depicts how the Northeast and the Northwest will continue to collaborate very closely from the leadership level down. So I think this collaborative relationship is not new, though, to most of us in Northern Ontario. So, for example, um, when I work um, on palliative care education initiatives uh, for both providers and learners within uh, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, I often work really closely with the palliative care team in Northwestern Ontario in Thunder Bay, as well as uh, CERO, which is the Center for Education and Research in Aging and Health at Lakehead University. And these are often really, really great collaboration that leads to um, like a lot of um, good education opportunities. So another really exciting change in terms of the move from uh, of OC, OPCN and palliative care into OH uh, Ontario Health is that we're now within the whole Ontario Health st structure. 
So we, um, so this is like Bob Ballantyne and I, as Palafka Clinical Colleagues for the Northeast, not only get to work with our Northwest counterparts, but also have a chance to meet regularly with the other clinical elites, and that includes primary care, critical care, emergency care, mental health and addiction. Um, so we are no longer really working on silos, but can collaborate and move our regional priorities forward together. So for an example, uh, you might be glad to hear that at our last meeting, I was actually ex able to explain within our clinical table um, with the least from the other sector, the concept of the concept of early palliative care. And it was actually a, a big aha moment for some of the other leads to, to start moving away from just thinking of us as end of life care. So it really shows that there is a lot of work that we still have to do to, to really explain and, and move forward what we as palliative care providers do. But it also gives me a lot of hope that our new structure is actually going to allow us to reach across sectors and be more effective in, or even more effective in what we do. So how about the palliative care structure itself within our region? So this is actually a bit of a historical slide. It shows the governance structure of the Northeast Palliative Care Network when I first took over the role of the physician lead um, in the region. And this is kind of at the beginning of the pandemic. So at that time, we were actually in a dual reporting situation. So we have a historical boss um, at the Regional Cancer Center, but we also work really closely with the Lynn. And some of you might remember Leanne Valicat, um, who actually work within the Lynn um, in the Northeast as our uh, palliative care planner, but she, is also, she was also our network director um, for the Northeast Palliative Care Network. And she, she was overseeing all the administrative leadership within our Northeast Palliative Care Network. Um, Leanne um, has basically gone on to her well-deserved retirement uh, last year as we were transitioning from the Lynn to the OH. So it's taken us about a year to rebuild our palliative care regional leadership um, with the transition into Ontario Health, but I think we're finally there. So this slide shows the current approved structure of the Northeast palliative care governance. So we'll still be tweaking this a little bit more along the way, especially when our Ontario Health team start to take shape. But we we are having we have a really strong team now already. Um, in order to um, carry out our work, and we also have the support of Ontario Health Northeast regionally. So as you can see here, we're no longer reporting um, to the cancer, uh, cancer Center, but um, we are only reporting to, uh, as clinical leads, to Dr. Paul Preston. Um, but we continue to have a really strong working relationship um, because of our history with the Northeast Cancer Center. So here is a list of the older um, and the new leaders within our regional uh, palliative care network. Um, I kind of included them just, I know that, you know, if you're working in our region, you might have come across some other names and it's kind of nice to kind of now getting a, um, a, a name attached to the roles. I'm sorry, I, I meant to try and even get the pictures, but I didn't get around to this. So next time I'll make sure that we have pictures for you too. Um, but this leadership group, um, we're currently meeting on a monthly basis, and our goal is really to ensure um, our recovery from the pandemic and then to support the continuation of the amazing work that's happening within our region. So I've kind of been alluding to our region quite a bit, and for the participants who are not from the Northeast or not familiar with our um, region, Here's a bit of a snapshot of the region uh, from earlier in 2022. So I've already alluded to the fact that we have a pretty vast geographical area. Um, and within the area, we have 23 public hospitals with 28 acute sites, with 42 long-term care and 27 family health teams. Um, we now, because it's another side, uh, we actually have three approved Ontario health teams now and more in development. And in terms of our population, uh, we have 13% of our population identified as Indigenous, 21% is Francophone, 
And um, in terms of healthcare needs, 30% is projected to be over 65 in the next 10 years. So here is again a map of our region, but this time we have um, the map of the hospitals. So as you can see, it's kind of spread uh, across a pretty big area. Um, the map itself might be too small for you to read, um, but just to kind of give you an idea, the different colors indicate the different districts within our region. Um, so Sudbury is somewhere here, I think. Um, no, down here somewhere here. Um, and that's basically um, our regional tertiary center. Um, the purple here is Waha, is uh, the district that for the most part um, is mostly accessible by plane only. Um, I, I think there's some trains that go through there too, uh, but most of the time, especially in the winter, plane is where we're kind of going with. And to help you understand the distance we have, for example, um, for a patient in horn pain here at the top uh, tip of this yellow, which is Algoma uh, district, um, this patient will have to travel just under 700 kilometers from horn pain um, to our tertiary center in Sudbury. So putting in perspective, if you guys are from, or if some of you are from Southern Ontario, um, or is familiar with it, this amount of time is probably, or it's about the same amount of time that could actually take you through the entire 401 across Southern Ontario from Windsor um, in the, at the Detroit um, border, all the way to Cornwall near the Quebec border. So, when we think about the vast geography of Northeast, it's really harder to picture how we can coordinate healthcare and work together, especially to ensure that everyone is able to access palliative care close to the home community, because it won't make sense for, you know, the, the, the patient and the family to have to travel, you know, that big distance to access um, care at the end of life. It, it really just is not patient-centered, right? So one of the, um, really amazing work that actually predates me uh, was done in our region about five years ago. Um, so we were able to establish one bed rural hospice suite in most of our small community hospitals across the Northeast. And associated with that is the development of palliative care infrastructure within each of these communities that will allow the communities to tailor um, their palliative care delivery towards the needs and the characteristics of the community, because we understand that each community is very unique um, and they're often isolated from other communities. So our Northeast palliative care structure or palliative care network structure follows the same principle in that we have de developed established relationship between the regional leadership and the local planning tables, um, as well as the different sectors. Um, and this is what we kind of do in terms of bringing everybody together into a regional steering committee. So historically, we have seven local planning tables that have the mandate to implement local initiatives and then recommend new funding proposals up to the Northeast Palliative Care Network and um, Ontario Health. Oh, I guess the Lynn before before Ontario Health was formed. So with our new structure within Ontario Health, we really are not expecting much of that principle to change. We understand that most of the work, like we were saying, is happening locally. So the OPC and secretary will bring um, the um, priorities down to the regional power of care networks leadership and steering committee, and then um, making sure that we are all aligned, but then the implementation will happen at the local level and across sectors. So now that we've covered um, the priorities, let's look at, oh, sorry, now that we've covered the structure, let's look a little bit, look at the priorities a little bit. Um, so, Let's start with the Ontario Health Strategic Priorities. So that's for the whole province. So when Ontario Health was formed, um, the priorities that we have set out uh, strategically are to reduce health inequities, to transform care with the person at the centre, 
to enhance clinical care and service excellence, and to maximize system value by applying evidence, and last but not least, to strengthen Ontario Health's ability to, to lead. So, based on the strategic priorities, Ontario Health's annual business plan is developed. So this is a critical planning document that sets out an overarching, um, the overarching goals, priorities, as well as key activities for the next three years. Um, on here, there's the focus on the fiscal year 2022 to 23. And this provides a blueprint that guides um, the work of Ontario Health to build for the future. So here it is, again, probably too small for you to see, but it is really good to see that palliative care is actually on the annual business plan. Uh, for Ontario Health, and um, is listed under the Enhanced Clinical Service, uh, Clinical Care and Service Excellence, and it reads uh, to transform and improve access and quality in palliative care. So, when we look at the actual item within the annual business plan of Ontario Health, this is what's on the three-year uh, plan. So some of you may have come across the document uh, put out by OPCN a few years ago um, of palliative care models of care for adults in the community setting. So this was published in 2010 and it's the action. Uh, so the action item for Ontario Health is to support the implementation recommendation in this framework in the community setting. Um, ideally integrated into the rest of the sectors, and especially as we transition into uh, to Ontario Health teams, and with a focus on long-term care. So, at the provincial level, um, there are two other palliative care models of care framework that is under development: uh, one for adults in the hospital setting, and one for pediatrics. So, the goal for us is to have these documents developed um, with kind of, again, input from a lot of the stakeholders, um, plus the expertise that we have within our palliative care community, um, and then have this document um, used by Ontario Health and so everybody in Ontario to guide the transformation needed to improve access to quality palliative care. So, based on the Ontario Health um, Annual Business Plan, the OPCN has suggested regional priorities um, for 2022 to 2023, and I think it's, this work is going to carry on to the next years as well um, as our regional priorities. So, this includes basically the implementation of the model of care for adults in the community, Mostly with a focus on home and community setting uh, with specific population like CHM and COPD, as well as in long term care home settings, and the integration of palliative care into OHT service delivery planning. So, I'm going to go over um, the work that's associated with uh, these parties actually in reverse order. So, um, I'll Third priority in the last slide refers to healthcare system integration and to continue to promote the integration of palliative care into Ontario Health team service delivery planning and provide the support, um, supportive resources and tools. So, in the Northeast, we currently only have three approved Ontario Health teams within our region. Um, there are other districts listed here that have come together to develop their OHT. And the work is in progress with Ontario Health and the Ministry of Health. So, in that sense, our good news is that we actually have the opportunity to make sure that as these groups are coming together and developing the, the work plan, that palliative care is going to be well integrated um, into the plan uh, right from the early stages. Recall that we've already kind of had an established structure um, and relationship between the region, regional leadership steering committee and our local tables. As our Ontario health teams take place, we plan to collaborate with the Ontario health team planning groups, both from the regional leadership level as well as from our local tables. And what we're really hoping to do is to transition in um, into following the OHT structure in terms of our regional steering committee geographical representation. So, in other words, 
this is what we are hoping that it will look like. So we will advocate for our local tables to become really a, an embedded part of care committee within the geographical Ontario health teams. And this will kind of create the first steps towards integration and better collaboration at all levels. Of course, we don't want to forget about our sectors. So again, this is the slide that we were showing earlier, but I think one of the things that we want to remember is that we will continue to work across sectors, both at the regional level as well as the local le level to broaden our reach. So going backwards now to our second priority um, regionally, which is to um, look at implementation of the framework for palliative care um, delivery in the adult population in the community. What we're hoping to do is be able to promote early identification of residents in need of a palliative care approach to care, even as early as upon admission or before they get admitted to the long-term care. And we also want to implement the support strategy that um, OPCN is actually working on for working with long-term care facilities on advanced care planning. Um, so kind of last but not least, this is a, going back to our first priority on the list of our regional priorities. We want to be implementing models of care um, for adults in the community with a focus on home and community setting, uh, focusing on specific populations such as CHF and COPD. So, um, like, I think a lot of you may recall our last year's conference with that focus on non oncologic population, because that's the population that's more and more recognized as an area that we need to do a better job, not necessarily our palliative care world, but us as well as the rest of healthcare to ensure the access to quality palliative care. So the specific projects that we have include promoting early identification of these patients that will benefit from a palliative care approach when they're facing a life-threatening non-oncological illness, developing an integrated approach to service delivery, and then again, supporting the implementation of advanced care planning. So now that I've outlined our uh, priorities, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Moore to look at how we can actually use evidence-based best practice to try and achieve these goals. So on to you, Dr. Moore. Palliative care in our Northeast region is provided by our primary care. So definitely a very different model from a lot of the major centers where the specialists take over the palliative care. In, in our region, most of the work, and I think Hailey, uh, Dr. Moore might allude to that, is, is really from primary care. Go ahead, Dr. Moore. Okay, I, I really apologize um, for that, but uh, we should be good to go now. Everyone, can, you can see my slides, Christine, can you? Yeah, okay. Perfect. Um, so I think um, okay. So I think uh, I just like Christine um, was really moved by Eugene Dufour's presentation as well, and just to kind of link that in again to what we're talking about today. So when we think of early identification, um, I think that's actually protective for uh, trauma, burnout, both from a patient perspective and a healthcare provider perspective too. If you have this early therapeutic relationship, integrated approach that um, you know is more likely to lead to care that was uh, concordant with the patient's wishes, um, I think that can be protective for all of us as well. Which again, I will allude to. Um, so this is meant to thanks Christine so much for that overview of what is actually going on in the north, and this is just meant to be a little bit of the theory the background and potentially some strategies for implementation. So this is, you know, an, an older antiquated model of, of palliative care um, that we're trying to move away from, but certainly still exists uh, in perhaps the minds of some people in some settings, um, which is, uh, you know, someone is diagnosed, we do everything we can to modify their disease. And then when that, when we reach a point that that is no longer working, then we move to palliative care. Of course, we're trying to move away from this. This would be kind of the opposite of early involvement of palliative care. Um, but I think we do need to acknowledge that, unfortunately, this is really still still common or still happening in a lot of settings. And so uh, uh, newer models have focused on early involvement, meaning we can think about things like palliative care even from the moment of diagnosis. Um, 
And likely, you know, at that point, there are also strong focuses on disease modifying therapies. But as time goes on, as life limiting illnesses progress, there becomes a greater and greater role for palliative care. Um, this, this particular model kind of uses the words palliative care with uh, hospice palliative care interchangeably. Um, something else that this a model like this adds on is that uh, the role of palliative care doesn't actually totally stop at the time of a patient's death, but continues on into grief support and bereavement. Um, e even here, I mean, this uh, a lot of these models were adopted for cancer. Um, and can't always apply perfectly to non cancer illnesses or some of the organ failure illnesses like heart failure, for example, where we think that like disease modifying therapy actually makes makes people feel better. Um, and so there's probably still work to be done on this too. But again, the emphasis being early involvement and involvement can, of a palliative care approach, and that can be as early as time of diagnosis. Um, this is again a newer model. This has been championed by Dr. Pippa Hawley, who uh, is out of BC. And the idea here of this, uh, which is, is being called the bow tie model. Again, uh, if we think of in the pink and red here being palliative care, supportive care, we can think that this can start as, easy, as early as time of diagnosis and perhaps become more and more of a prominent role as the patient's disease progresses. Um, one of uh, her kind of ideas as to why she would make a model like this um, is because patients are hesitant to enter a model where the only outcome is death. And so this is better meant to kind of better reflect the duality that, you know, we are preparing um, for disease progression. We are preparing for end of life. We're preparing for things like bereavement, but maybe even walking these two roads of continuing to have hope, um, perhaps even hope for cure, hope for improvement, hope for rehabilitation or survivorship. Um, uh, and, and that this can all be integrated with curing and controlling care. So I'm going to be talking a lot here about early palliative care involvement. And what we really mean by that is early involvement of a palliative care approach. Um, and so palliative care, you know, is a little bit nebulous to define and to measure in research studies too, right? Um, but when I'm talking about palliative care approach, that doesn't need to mean, you know, referral to a secondary level palliative care specialist. Um, that can just mean a, a holistic approach, which, you know, as was mentioned in the comments is, is especially in the northern and rural areas, often driven by a primary care team. Um, and by primary care, I don't actually just mean family physicians. I mean, whoever are the people usually caring for that person, uh, whether that's, um, uh, and that's really meant to reflect kind of the multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary nature of palliative care, right? Um, so can we embed a palliative care approach and skills in things like primary care physicians, home care workers? And I mean, the list here goes on and on and on. And I know that I have missed people here as well. Um, you know, the, the respiratory therapist who's seeing a patient for COPD, can they have skills to help with an early palliative care approach? So multidisciplinary is the key here. And then also holistic. Um, so I, I mean, this could be kind of a talk in and of itself of what is a palliative care approach. Um, but when we think of uh, holistic, we think about um, uh, symptom management, uh, of course, always being a part of the puzzle. Social issues. Um, I think someone just mentioned in the comments, like, uh, like care navigation. Um, I hope I'm interpreting that correctly. And, I, and like, exactly, that's totally right. Like, access to 24 7 supports and care. Um, uh, the list goes on here spiritual issues, um, identifying goals of care, but also fears, values, hopes for the future, understanding of illness, uh, caregiver support, which is often something that is um, uh, that, that can be unfortunately easily neglected. Um, and then again, this idea of grief and loss. Um, yeah, someone else mentioned pharmacies. So yes, I know I apologize already that I'm sure I missed so many people here, but um, just to say that the, the list is really, really long. Um, and ideally everyone who has contact with the patient can have some skills of this, uh, of palliative care. And so when I talk here about palliative care involvement, it doesn't just mean, you know, like a, a palliative care physician, it means everybody, right? So, so why is this important? It's been, um, I'm going to speak about cancer first and then non-cancer, but it's been now like quite well established that uh, palliative care, 
early involvement of palliative care um, for life limiting illnesses um, is kind of a win 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 situation. So, I mean, we, th we think of uh, things that have been shown, like improved quality of life with early involvement of palliative care, which is, of course, you know, the utmost importance and one of the main goals of palliative care, right? Things like improved mood, improved anxiety. Um, less aggressive interventions at the end of life. So people being able to more um, and, and uh, you know, improved place of uh, desired care at end of life, more people able to die in their homes with early involvement and less people dying perhaps with in ICU or with ag more aggressive interventions. Um, also improved healthcare utilization. So again, early involvement of a multidisciplinary holistic palliative care approach. Um, improves uh, healthcare utilization from the sense of, you know, decreasing emergency department visits, decreasing admissions, um, uh, which is not only important for the patient, of course, first and foremost, but important for the healthcare system as well, especially now when we're in this, you know, time of crisis all over the news of, you know, healthcare resources are at such a premium. Um, something like an early involvement of, uh, of a palliative care approach can, can really be a solution to this. Um, and then, of course, the, so I referenced a couple of studies here. The, this TEML study is, is kind of one of the most famous early ones of early involvement of palliative care in lung cancer, and, and they actually showed improved survival. Some, some subsequent studies have showed improved survival, some have shown no change, but again, the idea being that this, this doesn't shorten prognosis to have this early intervention. Um, and then uh, the the actual evidence in non-cancer illness is is kind of still catching up to cancer because a lot of the palliative care models have really been designed and um, initially focused around cancer. Um, but I mean, there certainly is evidence out there in CHF renal failure. There's some I didn't put up here in you know COPD as well. Um, again, uh, early involvement can lead to improved quality of life, um, improved mood. Um, improved documentation of healthcare preferences, uh, again, improved healthcare utilization. Um, and again, these patients with organ failure, we think of, you know, CHF, COPD um, in end stages can often be, uh, you know, really uh, frequenting places like the emergency department, the ICU, the, um, the wards quite frequently. Um, and again, some evidence for, for helping with uh, patient oriented outcomes in renal failure. Um, now, I've mentioned here early, I mean, what is early? We'll get into that a little bit more, but for example, some of the cancer studies showed that really things start to, the, the curves start to, to separate, the outcomes start to really differ after someone's been involved with a palliative care approach for about four months. Um, and so the, things, the thing is this intervention can really help, this intervention can really work, uh, but it does take some time and that requires, of course, some early intervention. Uh, something that's not listed here, because, you know, it didn't come across necessarily in the papers that I was reading, um, but uh, s something that I was also thinking of is, you know, I think back to Eugene DeFore's presentation and think of, you know, the traumas that healthcare providers, patients, families have experienced. And I wonder if something like this could help too, right? It seems intuitive that if we're improving, you know, place of care, we're preparing people, um, we're having less aggressive interventions at the end of life. Um, if I reflect kind of on myself personally, I think that one of the things that perhaps induces, you know, burnout stress in me the most is thinking that I'm doing care for someone that's that's not the best care for them or maybe is not what they would really want or maybe it even is futile, right? Um, and so if we can, you know, go home at the end of the day and said, you know, the care that we did for those people, I think that was the best care and I think that was in their best interest and I think that was in concordance with their wishes, as we have discussed over this course of this early intervention, I think that that could really be, um, uh, you know, that can be dignity preserving for people and that can be burnout protective uh, for us as a healthcare community, patients and families and their bereavement as well. I saw a quick question asking about uh, dementia care. The, the honest answer to that is there's not as much out there of earlier intervention with dementia care, with, uh, like as far as, you know, how much does this help? Does this help with quality of life? Again, this seems kind of intuitive, but I think the research maybe hasn't uh, caught up enough yet. Uh, just to take a little bit of a segue specifically into non-cancer illnesses, which is one of the um, priorities identified, again, by um, uh, by the OHT and through what, some of what Dr. Pun spoke about. Um, 
So, I mean, we know that patients with non-cancer illnesses have, you know, similar burdens of symptoms um, of caregiver burnout of healthcare utilization to patients with cancer. So the need is there, uh, but that the access to palliative care um, is, is even later and is even less. Um, and so what are some of the reasons for that? One of the reasons is that prognostication in non-cancer illness is substantially more difficult. Um, you know, we think of this is this is borrowed from from pallium here, but um, this is kind of the the classic thought of a trajectory in someone with with an organ failure, which is that uh, you know yes, they're gradually having a functional decline over time, but it's punctuated by these series of exacerbations and incomplete recoveries, and it can be really difficult to predict. You know, which exacerbation. Uh, is, is actually going to lead to their death and which are they actually going to have a good recovery from, right? Um, with emerging cancer therapies, I mean, some cancers are starting to look more like this as well, right? So, so number one challenge of identifying these patients is that pr prognosis, uh, determining the prognosis is more difficult to start with. Um, uh, second, you know, a lot of palliative care approaches have been built around the cancer model and in the cancer model, Things that uh, prolong th things that are disease managing, such as chemotherapy and such as radiation, are often not uh, symptom managing. They can be, um, but you know, chemo can have a lot of side effects. Radiation can have a lot of side effects. It can, you know, lead to transient uh, symptom escalations and transient decreases in functional status. Uh, basically, in short, they can make people not not feel very good, right? And so the line in the sand of, okay, if the chemo is not working and if it's making you feel bad, then we'll just stop it, right? And so there can be a little bit more of a clear demarcation. The, the waters are a lot more muddied in things like CHF, COPD, um, because uh, if we think of a patient with with heart failure, you know, optimizing their medications and their diet and their fluid status and their diuretics and their, um, the, the guideline management of heart failure can actually make people feel better, right? Um, you know, their breathing is better, their energy is better, their mobility is better. So there's no one clear line of, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna stop the disease management now. And so we have to change our approach and our paradigm to say that palliative care can coexist with disease management um, and, and, and strengthen, you know, uh, the, the link between those two. Another challenge is that um, patients often have uh, less of an understanding, especially in some illnesses, of the progressive nature of their illness, of the prognosis associated with their illness, and of some of the intensive therapies. So, for an example, there have been some studies of patients with dialysis, and you know, a surprising number, or to me, what is surprising, I should say, number of patients think that dialysis is you know helping to improve their kidney function or helping to cure their kidneys, uh, whereas really that's not the case at all. It's it's replacing the kidneys function. Um, uh, and, and prognosis on dialysis is, can often be poor, right? And so, um, we, uh, that, that's just one example in kidney function, but, um, COPD, for example, many patients think that there is, you know, significant capacity for their disease to go away and cure and improve. Whereas we know that it's a progressive life limiting illness. Um, and so. For these patients, introducing the notion and the idea of palliative care can be uh, met with a little bit more of a challenge. So, to go back, I'm just going to give a little bit of Ontario data of where are we at with early identification of, uh, of palliative care needs. So, this is um, from Health Quality Ontario and OPCN. This is uh, an update of data that they sent out in 2019. Um, whenever I'll say this with all with a caveat, because whenever we're measuring, you know, who got palliative care, um, palliative care again is nebulous to define, is difficult to research and say, you know, did this person get palliative care or not? And often, unfortunately, um, non-physician and non-nurse and non-home care uh, interventions um, are not uh, are not measured in these kind of studies. But this, you know, this was this looked at things like billing data at home care at, at physician notes at home care notes to say who is receiving palliative care. So with the caveat that it's not perfect, the data, um, I mean, we can really see that, you know, almost half uh, by their metric only had, you know, starting a palliative care approach within their very last month of life. And like I said, some of those studies, like you need, like you, you need months necessarily to really start seeing those improvements, like improvements in quality of life, healthcare utilization, um, you know, care concordant with their wishes, right? 
Um, this, I, I tried to dig around a little bit on data for um, what's happening urban versus what's happening rural and remote. And I think, I think we know this intuitively, and I know this was already mentioned in the comments. Um, so rurally, I mean, uh, we're looking here at the dark blue being urban and the light being rural and remote. This is data from the Canadian Society, Society of Palliative Care Physicians. And it's basically saying for patients in these regions, uh, you know, who are they getting palliative care from? Um, and I think it's no surprise that when we're talking rural and remote, uh, you know, very often we're looking at a family physician and much less so at a uh, secondary level palliative care specialist um, or a palliative care team. Um, Furthermore, we know that there's uh, there's inequities, frankly, in access to home health care in uh, some of these more rural areas, uh, which makes things like dying in a preferred place of care even more difficult. I think this data probably, um, you know, someone can chime in if I'm wrong, but I, I think this probably isn't isn't surprising to too many people. This is a little bit of old data. This is 2015, um, but I, I would suspect that it still rings true. So. Um, if we're thinking of how can we identify these people early, knowing the challenges that exist, number one, knowing that prognostication is difficult, can we improve prognostication models to help uh, help identify these people earlier? And knowing that prognostication is never going to be perfect, uh, can we think about models that, you know, uh, someone can access palliative care, not just based on their prognosis, on how much time they have left, but on needs? Um, and so I'm going to go first through, you know, how could just uh, maybe a couple of tools or resources when we think about improving prognostication for these patients, and especially I'm focusing a little bit on prognostication and non-cancer illnesses, which uh, again has been historically even more difficult. Many of you have probably heard of the surprise question, meaning would I be surprised if this patient died in the last year, which really relies on just salt on knowing the patient and on kind of. Uh, experience and knowing their clinical situation, and so there is some merit to it, and I think some of the merit to it is based on the fact that it's it's essentially no resource, right? It can take you know a second to really try to get a gestalt of this. Um, but more recent studies have kind of called into question how sensitive this question is, and whether we're actually missing people with this question. And so, ideally, uh, can we use gestalt and our knowledge of the patient, but also use uh, a bit of a data driven approach? I'm going to just briefly go through two more kind of data driven approaches of prognostication. Um, uh, and again, this is applicable to patients with non cancer illnesses. So I'm going to focus on one tool on inpatients and one on outpatients. So for inpatients, um, there's been developed this uh, Homer tool or hospital one year mortality risk. Um, and so there have been some. Um, uh, you know, healthcare regions that have incorporated this into their electronic health records. So again, this is for inpatients. And the reason it can be integrated is because all of these variables um, are a part of a standard admission. If a patient gets admitted to hospital, these are all calculated, you know, yes or no, um, arrived by ambulance or not. And again, this, this um, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail of the risk score, but again, this can be kind of automatically calculated based on their data. Um, and so, um, the idea is that this isn't doesn't need to be time intensive, but can kind of pop up and say, you know, it, it's quite good at identifying who may have less than one year of prognosis. And so, can we integrate this into our health records to say, you know, a reminder to the to, to the uh, care team that's seeing them, you know, this patient has quite a strong risk of dying within the next year, um, and thinking, can we integrate a palliative care approach into their care? I'm going to talk a little bit more about the respect tool, which I'm a bit more familiar with, and um, I've actually been using with, and I found it to be helpful. Um, so this is for um, for elderly people, so people over 65, and uh, and for people living in the community and for people getting home care. This project, Big Life, has been a project out of Ottawa with the Briere Institute and the Ottawa Hospital, and the idea is we have you know. Thousands and thousands and thousands of interise, which is the assessment tool used by home care when anyone gets home care or gets admitted to long term care. There's an interise done, which is a data set about the patient essentially. And so they've used this in the sense of using big data to spit out an algorithm and say, based on, you know, the input of the interise, how long do we think that this uh, this person may have to live? Um, one of the nice things about it is that it's meant to be patient facing. So a provider can, can quickly fill it out. Um, 
uh, and it doesn't require a lot of kind of intensive medical data, right? Um, so someone who maybe is not even as familiar with the patient or a caregiver can fill this out and take a look at it. And again, it's meant to be patient and caregiver friendly as well. Um, there are many prognostication tools out there. One of the reasons I've picked this one to present is because uh, I think it better reflects, first of all, it's all using Ontario data, which is nice. Um, it has gone through some early validation, which looks good, and it can be used for these patients with multimorbidity and frailty. Um, and so I'm going to briefly try to share a different screen, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to not go too crazy about the technology today. Um, and not put you through another wait for that, but let me see if I can do it really quickly here. Okay, I think this I think this worked. Um, so this is the respect tool. Uh, I linked it there as well. Um, so I just uh, I just put in a theoretical patient here. This I put in a theoretical seventy five year old man with with heart failure. And so you can see, I mean, this is um, it does incorporate uh, some gestalt as well. Um, and a little bit about their ADLs. You can fill this out, I find, reasonably quickly if you've met the patient. Um, this person I said was receiving oxygen therapy and it also takes into account whether they were hospitalized or admitted. And when we uh, go to results here, so um, this is what it spits out at the end, which is, Again, meant to be kind of hopefully easily interpreted by patients. It does give a specific number, but it also acknowledges some of the uncertainty um, and the range of responses, right? Um, and so, again, I've, I personally have found this helpful. And I've been filling it out on patients I see um, after I see them to say, you know, uh, is what I'm thinking about their prognosis? Has it kind of corroborated with with uh, more of a data driven approach? Okay, I'm going to go back to presentation. Okay. So, um, um, so that was the respectful. I'm sorry, I'm, my controls are giving me trouble now. We're, we're back. Thanks for being with me here. So, uh, so that was the respect tool. I have found that helpful. Um, so those are a, a couple of tools about prognostication. Um, but like I said, prognostication is never going to be perfect. And can we also think of models that think about need of palliative care approach and not just prognostication? Um, so when we think of need, I mean, that can just be based on your, your front facing view of the patient, right? Uh, are they having a, sim a significant symptom burden? Are they having a caregiver burnout? Are they having psychosocial or spiritual distress? Um, are they having trouble ha navigating the healthcare system with respect to their life limiting illness? Um, when I looked through some of the OPCN recommendations, one of the tools that they had recommended was this tool called RADPAC, which has, was made in Belgium. Um, they, their idea of the RADPAC, and so it's, uh, it's from this university in Belgium and indicators for palliative care needs. Um, it's, um, it's designed as having some indicators for cancer, for COPD, and for CHF, which may say, you know, maybe this is time to think about a palliative care approach. Um, and there's also been a newer one now developed for Parkinson's disease. Um, so this is an example of the one for uh, COPD, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, so it takes into account function, um, physical symptom burden, um, uh, existential distress, uh, so some of these, I think, I don't know if I would classify it as so, so early, like if a patient mentioning end of life approaching, you know, that certainly should be a trigger. Um, some of these don't seem early, early to me, um, but they have this, the way that they intend this tool to be used is kind of, uh, you know, if you have a patient with, uh, with COPD, can you think about doing this tool, you know, yearly or every half year of glancing at it and saying, oh yeah, you know, actually in the last year, now they've also got CHF and some serious dyspnea. Um, maybe it's time to think about this. The one for Parkinson's disease is a little bit more robust as well, um, because it has some indicators that 
advanced care planning is a good time to start and also um, thinking of, you know, when is a time to start um, more of a global palliative care approach. I'm, I'm, I know you have access to the slides, so I'm not going to go through all of these 1 by 1, um, but again, these are meant to be based on need, not just on prognosis. And so physical symptoms are there, but also psychosocial symptoms are in there as well. And so when we think of, okay, we have identified this person. Now we want to have an early intervention and an early palliative care approach for them. What does that look like? Um, I pulled the, this actually from the, uh, Alberta cancer society's guidelines. Um, cause this was their idea of, you know, the pieces of a puzzle of an early palliative care intervention, because you'll see here, you know, this doesn't. These pieces of the puzzle don't mention death or dying or hospice um, uh, is meant to be, you know, what can we think of early, uh, really early on? Um, so we, uh, they have things like, you know, what is their illness comprehension? Do they know what dialysis is doing for them um, and coping with their illness? Uh, again, symptom burden, functional status is always a part of the picture. Uh, coordination of care, especially for these patients with multimorbidity, which can be particularly complex. Um, and then thinking about advanced care planning, thinking about identifying a substitute decision maker. So these can all be, uh, you know, key components of an early palliative care uh, approach. Some of the things I came across that kind of resonated with me is that I think um, as healthcare providers, whether we're physicians or PSWs or pharmacists or whomever we are, I think sometimes we need kind of a clear outcome. Okay, so we did this palliative care intervention, you know, from my uh, physician prescriber bias perspective, I think, you know, if I do this intervention, you know, maybe the goal is that at the end, like, you know, their code status is now do not resuscitate and they have a prescription for an opioid and they, um, we've done some deep prescribing of their meds. You know, we think that we need these really tangible outcomes. And so sometimes I think palliative care as a whole struggles with early intervention when, you know, maybe those things don't need to happen quite yet. And what are our tangible outcomes? Um, like our lovely speaker from this morning said, like, sometimes just being with a person, uh, listening more than talking can be a really important part of an early palliative care intervention. Um, so to say, you know, if you're not too sure what to do to not necessarily go in with a goal, you know, we don't need a DNR on a, on a 1st palliative care approach visit. Um, we just need to maybe identify, uh, their values, their goals, their illness understanding, um, education can be an important outcome, you know, knowledge of what palliative care is and that it exists can be an important an outcome. And so changing our own expectations of, of what that looks like uh, when we're involved with somebody really early. Okay. Um, so I think uh, probably some of you have seen this. I'm going to use this model to talk a little bit about, you know, where are the points that we can intervene and help to ha help people to have an early integrated approach to their, uh, to their palliative care. So this uh, model um, comes from the Canadian Society of Palliative Care for well, and also from, from LEAP and from Pallium. And so the idea is that, you know, the vast majority and bulk of palliative care is not done by specialists. It's in the blue here. Um, often, you know, in this, in as like the, the foundation and the base of the pyramid is also included the community, right? So these are all the front facing people who are seeing the patient on a day to day basis, uh, their family physician, their PSW, their pharmacist, um, you put those you know, in their, there. Uh, their dialysis nurse. I'm just cleaning out a bunch. Um, and so the, the vast majority of palliative care is done by this group. Um, I think we could say that in the north, this top pink triangle is probably even, even smaller and that primary care is, uh, taking on an, an even greater, um, an even greater role. And so, uh, if we think of, you know, level, com level of complexity, when level of complexity of palliative care needs get really high, that's when we can think about involving specialist palliative care, um, that's not just physicians that includes physicians, but can also include nurses, uh, palliative care, social work specialists. Um, and so, uh, some people will be really complex and, and need this level of, uh, intensive, uh, specialist level palliative care all the way along, but those are quite a bit more rare. Uh, many people can exist for a, for a large part of their trajectories and especially the early part of their trajectories in this primary level approach to palliative care. Perhaps they will have a complex symptom exacerbation or complex home care needs or any other number of things. That means that they will transiently need specialist palliative care, or perhaps they will move entirely to, to specialist palliative care. Um, but again, the, the whole foundation of this pyramid is, you know, the community, um, the people seeing them on a day to day basis. And so. 
So here's our pyramid um, and uh, this is just meant to be a little bit of an indication of, you know, where are the places that uh, we can help to actually um, intervene early. Um, and so if we think of the community level, um, how can we help the community to help us with that early approach to palliative care? Um, you know, we live in a, a community and a culture that often sees death as a failure or as a taboo topic or as an uncomfortable topic. And so, um, I mean, there's so many really neat interventions thinking about as a whole community and as a whole society, how can we help support people who have life limiting illnesses who are dying or who are grieving um, in an inclusive way? Uh, one such kind of interesting one is compassionate communities, which again is meant to bring things like, like let's talk about death in schools. Um, let's um, Let's, uh, you know, let's talk about death as a society. Let's talk about life limiting illnesses and what living with that is like. Um, and so just increasing comfort and increasing the community's ability to support each other is absolutely going to help with that early intervention. Within primary care, I mean, uh, comfort, uh, you know, when we look at some of the barriers to, to primary level care providers uh, giving palliative care, it's, you know, comfort with having these conversations, skills to manage symptoms and to have these conversations and to plan and to prognosticate and to predict. Um, and so, I, I mean, I think this kind of goes without saying, but so how do we actually do this? And I think the way we do this is, you know, whether uh, whether someone is going through training for PSW or for social work or for pharmacy or for medical school or anything, um, not just to have it as like a specialty that you learn about for a day, but to integrate it across the sectors and across the curriculum. Um, uh, like one one interesting example that I I liked. This is again coming my, kind of from my physician perspective, but at the University of Toronto, uh, the medical school there, you know, they used to when they learned about COPD, they would learn about it based on a case. And in that case, this patient you know gets diagnosed with COPD, and then it gets more and more severe, and then he gets a lung transplant. And I mean that's just not actually the and then and then you you know goes on to 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 live a long long life, and that's we know that's not the reality, unfortunately, for many people with COPD. And so they changed their curriculum to say you know. But this isn't a palliative care unit. This is a unit where we're talking about COPD and learning about it. But in that case, the patient actually ultimately um, ultimately passed away and died of their COPD. And, you know, they discussed what the symptom management and the end of life care of that looked like. So integrating it and weaving it into the fabric of learning and not having it being its own separate specialty. Um, and furthermore, then, you know, when we think of people in practice, integrating it into guidelines, one of the examples that I really like is, you know, the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines for management of COPD, which again, are not palliative care guidelines, but, but the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines say, you know, make reference to things like using opioids for shortness of breath and integrating a palliative care approach. So it's right in. Um, and so that's how we're actually going to reach, you know, primary level care is, you know, they're, they're following these guidelines and if palliative care is integrated right into it, that's going to help. Um, I think another way that we can allow for this early intervention is to allow for integrated care between primary level uh, palliative care providers and specialist level. And so uh, one of the often cited barriers of referring to a specialist team is, you know, worries about abandoning the patient or um, worries that, you know, making it seem like they're giving up on the patient or having to, to give up care and responsibility and therapeutic relationship with them. And so I think both from a primary level and a specialist level, uh, I think we're obligated to hopefully allow for good communication and integration of care. That means that these two can happen concurrently. Some of that means breaking down uh, some of the barriers to communication between the two. Um, this is a bit anecdotal, but I think I found that, you know, often, you know, we know that primary level care providers are such an important part of the care team, but often this, the specialist notes and information are going to the primary team, but sometimes it's not vice versa, right? Uh, like maybe the specialist team wants to know, you know, what's the family doctor doing? What's the PSW doing that's helping with this palliative care approach? And so making this like truly a two way communication. Um, I, um, have had the good fortune of having some mentors in a number of communities uh, that have helped to build palliative care programs. And I think something that's really common across communities that have had good success with palliative care programs is that they have been able to break down these silos between specialists and primary palliative care, but also between hospital and home care and between home care and hospice and uh, between the family doctor's offices and, and home care and so on and so forth. Um, 
from a specialist level, what can we do to help with early intervention? I think um, mitigating or removing some of the barriers to referral, some of which I've already referred to. Um, this is a quote from an article by Dr. Pippa Hawley out of BC that I, I think I, I couldn't summarize it or say it any better than this. So I've kind of quoted it and it's entirely here. So, so basically what this is saying is, you know, we know that specialist palliative care resources are uh, scarce, especially in the north. And so he, here's what she says about this. So the patient characteristics used to ration scarce palliative care resources also perpetuate misperception of palliative care as being appropriate only at end of life when all efforts to, to cure or control have failed. So we give our patients and colleagues mixed messages. Refer early, but only when you're 100% sure the patient is dying. Refer early, but we don't have room for anybody but the sickest. Um, and so to me, this kind of, uh, you know, was a little bit of a wake up call to say, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we do this. Um, uh, secondary palliative care specialists do this because resources are scarce. We know we can't see and help everybody. And so we, we restrict the criteria and we only say, you know, it, you know, only if they have a DNR, only if they're dying and only if they're really sick, can we actually help them out? And it perpetuates this barrier and this idea that, um, Early integrated palliative care is, is not as important, or you know, you can only get your needs met if if uh, if you know symptoms and needs are already really really high. Um, so how can we remove some of those barriers? Also, I think sometimes um, uh, specialist palliative care providers. Um, a lot of our evidence and models are based around some of maybe even the what I would call later uh, referrals, and so care at the end of life, like. Um, someone had mentioned, you know, earlier, you know, what's the evidence for earlier intervention in dementia care? Like, to my knowledge, anyways, there's not a lot out there. We need better research on this. How can we actually help people when we're seeing them early? Knowing the challenges in the north, I mean, um, knowing that uh, not every community is going to have a specialist palliative care provider. How can we um, expand care, expand consultations, provide virtual care? Um, again, it's going to be another another way to allow for earlier intervention. And the other thing is, you know, in a lot of places where specialist palliative care resources are scarce, they're often um, centered in the hospital and uh, or doing home visits um, or perhaps both. And so if we're talking about early, you know, sometimes these patients need neither. Sometimes they just need like a community clinic that they can go to. Um, and so bolstering those resources is going to be helpful as well. And then uh, so this is my last slide, and this is just to say, um, I think something that everybody can do that will help to remove stigma and barriers to early intervention of palliative care is to be kind of cautious about how we're speaking about it. Um, and so to say something like, uh, you know, uh, this patient was deemed palliative or they've gone palliative now um, or things like this, which I think we hear pretty commonly and I think uh, it's kind of a shorthand and we know uh, we know what people mean, but I think it creates this idea that it's kind of black and white all or nothing, you know, and for a uh, to say this person is deemed palliative, I think that can be stigmatizing uh, for a person That's and can lead to increased resistance of patients not wanting to talk about palliative care or be referred to palliative care or think about palliative care. And so if we can use terms like a palliative approach to care or integrating palliative care into their usual care um, uh, and not talking about a person being palliative, I think, I think that can go a long way. And I think that's something that anybody can do to remove some of those barriers for earlier intervention. I mean, there's some uh, places like even, you know, Toronto has a, uh, Princess Margaret has a supportive care unit. And so that's that's kind of a debate in and of itself. You know, the palliative care, the words have a lot of power, but maybe have a lot of stigma for some people. And so can we gently introduce it as supportive care and then and then help them to really receive the full benefits of palliative care? Um, I think you can tell that, you know, this is a topic that, uh, you know, I, well, personally, I learned quite a bit about it just from, from um, from doing this presentation, but also I think there's clearly quite a bit of uh, room to go. And I see there's been quite a few questions in the chat. So I'll say that, you know, my references are available and maybe we can have some time for questions for uh, for both Dr. Pun and myself and some discussion. And uh, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Moore and Dr. Pun. And I am going to uh, go through the chat and uh, bring up some of the questions that we've had. Um, uh, first, uh, Francis Cabertus, in rural communities, the hospital ER and inpatient unions, units are often the place to obtain care. 
Hence, ER hospital admissions are not necessary an indicator of poor care and something that should be avoided. They can represent excellent palliative care um, in hospital, in hospice palliative care model. And also, uh, Dr. Calbertus has um, also asked a question earlier um, regarding um, how is um, when Christine, when you were first talking about um, how this goes to the, you know, the top levels and how is this come back down to our community? Can you sort of share a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, we definitely recognize like when we talked about, you know, how we know that we get the priorities set up like with OPCM, with Ontario Health, with the regional steering committee. What we then know is a lot of this work happens in the local table, right? And like to Francis' point, like a lot of these local tables, obviously, if they're in, like we we've had really good examples of good lo like amazing local tables set up as an integrated team, but it's actually based in primary care model, right? So like I know Timmins has a great team. Elliot, like I actually just had a text from Nancy uh, from the Elliot Lake Family Health team again. So a lot of our local table work are definitely happening at the primary care level and and their input in terms of how we can shape palliative care in the region um, is what we go by regionally. Okay, yeah, so her question was, how is primary care represented in reporting to Ontario Health and within regional teams and networks? Okay. Um, also so, sorry, could I, could I just say, um, yeah. So for uh, th thanks for that comment that you know hospital and ER admissions are not necessarily indicator of poor care. Like I think that's really important for me to remember as well. Working in a you know small but not that small place. Um, so I think you're totally right, and I think that's one more reason even that some of the uh, evidence that's presented of you know who gets palliative care is probably uh, even less representative of rural communities. So thanks for that. Okay, and also another comment that. Um, either one of you might want to speak to is caregiver burnout for non cancer diagnosis is often longer and makes the needs even greater and the social deprivation much greater. Do you have any comments on that? I don't know that I have too much more to add other than to say that I definitely agree. And I think we, um, yes, non cancer illnesses, and I think we see that quite a bit in. Uh, in dementia and major neurocognitive disorders as well. Um, and so, and, and ALS motor neuron diseases is another one that, uh, that, you know, the caregivers health and well-being is really affected as well. So I, I totally agree and all the more, all the more reason for this early intervention. I completely agree. And to add to that, I think, you know, what comes to mind was that like my whole debate when I tried to talk to my daughter about what palliative care really means and how we medicalize, you know, illnesses and death and dying so much that really a lot of this has to do with when we have the vision of palliative care, like it's a social event, it's a social issue when we don't have enough support for our caregivers. And really kind of looking at, I mean, Haley alluded to the compassion community and other efforts that really bring the community together. And I, I really like your model of like, you know, yeah, a lot of times, like, you know, even when we first presented, it was like primary level and secondary level palliative care. But like, we keep forgetting that the community is at the base of all of this. So I think that really drives home the, the importance of community when we think about these patients and the families. Thank you. Um, another comment uh, Dr. Pun, thank you for the excellent presentation. Our hospital in Perth has a palliative care t care room at one each of their sites. However, those two rooms are often used for ALC patients and now very rarely for end of life patients. How did you get this commitment from the hospital to dedicate the space to be only for hospice palliative care patients? So I can't take credit for this because um this kind of predates me a little bit, but I actually cheated and um, texted my uh, co-lead, um, Barb Valentine. So um, the history is that these beds were actually, so we really advocated for these beds um, for palliative care hospice bed funding, and these are actually accredited hospice beds. Um, and this funding is actually separate for uh, using it for a, a, a end of life as we understand it. So that's why, you know, the funding part will be different. Um, at times we do understand that in the, in the community hospital in the short bed state, and there's no one who need the palliative care bed or the hospice bed, they would kind of use it. Um, but 
what we kind of continue to do is to advocate for like the need for the, the hospice suite, um, including actually even recently, like one of the pet peeve, again, speaking to Francis point is, you know, how we get captured and, and some of the use of the hospice a credit hospice bed was actually captured as death in the hospital, which is obviously completely wrong. Um, but what we kind of continue to do is kind of advocate, but also then have a, this is again a very big team approach with CCAs or home and community care support services, um, really to make sure that um, the end of life. Uh, patients who need the bed actually get um, the bed. So it's, it is a community resource from the way it's structured and not a hospital resource. Okay, Dr. Moore, do you have anything to add to that? I think that, that was a great answer by Dr. Pun. I don't know that I have too, too much to add to that, honestly. Okay. The next Thanks. question is for Dr. Moore. For the studies that show that uh, PC, primary care benefits patients in many ways, was primary care compared to other forms of psychotherapy? If so, how did primary care interventions vary from those that might be provided in regular psychotherapy? So I think that if I'm interpreting that correctly, I think that's a question about, uh, you know, the evidence that earlier intervention of palliative care helps. Um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done of translating this so just trying to answer the question, um, for the studies in cancer, like they were larger RCTs and they did compare it to psychotherapy of some kind. And so they were able to say a little bit more definitively, like, yes, uh, you know, the, the holistic palliative care approach, even more so than a psychotherapy intervention is beneficial. Um, the studies in non-cancer illnesses were perhaps a little bit less like methodologically robust. And so they um, often just compared it to usual care. Um, and the other shortcoming, I will say, honestly, of these is that a lot of them are done in tertiary centers um, where the focus of the palliative care intervention is more so on that, you know, like top little part of the pyramid of specialist palliative care more so than primary palliative care. Um, so I'll be honest that there are some shortcomings uh, of those studies, really. Okay. Um, next, we have um, a comment, and and um, I think she's sort of asking for some some suggestions too. Steps in training and support to our First Nation communities is unfolding, and with a step by step process to bridge the gaps and challenges by providing palliative care and end of life quality. So, any suggestions on how um, you know? Uh, the First Nation communities might be able to get some extra support. So I, I know, you know, resource shortages is an issue everywhere and particularly rurally and particularly within um, uh, some of our First Nations communities. I don't know that I'm going to have a perfect answer to this, but some things that come to mind are, um, again, when we talk about bolstering that primary approach, um, there are barriers to accessing palliative care. Um, and there are also some uh, barriers due to, of course, many historical traumas for uh, people who identify as First Nations to access the healthcare system. And so I think those can be compounded on top of each other, right? And so if we can think about interventions within the communities of uh, having people within uh, people within their community upskilled on palliative care approaches, that's going to go a long way as opposed to, you know, having to travel to another community, um, having to face potentially not trauma enforced care or re traumatization. Um, so, I, I guess the main thing I have to say is that 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 primary care base of the pyramid is, is even probably more important in that case. Yeah, and I do know that like within the North, I mean, I definitely am learning a lot from like our champions, both from uh, Lakehead University, um, the Northwest group, as well as um, like our group. Um, well, actually, one of my palliative care physicians right now is um, Dr. Peltier, who is actually our cancer regional lead for Indigenous, um, Indigenous lead. Um, plus, I think the other thing with, um, and she works from Manitoulin and Sudbury. The other thing that's really exciting is Memoising is actually one of our approved Ontario health teams. 
and uh, understanding, learning from Edith and her team regarding like the creator care and all that's being created. Um, it's been really, really helpful. And I think one of the other things I probably would advocate for is really just that connection is so important. Like when we start knowing other people who are doing amazing work, um, being able to connect with them and, and work together. So I think one of one of the comments earlier was like, let's not reinvent the wheel, but work together and just make everything better. Thank you. Um, another question, any similar tool for younger population or, or even pediatric populations? Sadly, most tools are geared towards more elderly or fail, fair, frail patients. Is it difficult to imagine pediatric palliative approach? It is difficult to imagine a pediatric approach. So I guess she's speaking to the scales that you suggested. Dr. Moore, do you have anything regarding a younger population or pediatric? I don't, I don't have a specific tool offhand. I wish that I did because I agree when we talk about healthcare inequities. I mean, pediatric palliative care. Some of those inequities are are really exacerbated, unfortunately. Um, so, without having any specific tool in mind, what I can say just from uh, some experiences. So, for example, I, I one potential approach is, I mean. Thankfully, you know, the within pediatrics, the population who have life limiting or very serious illnesses um, is smaller, right? They're a smaller group. And so one potential approach, like for example, at uh, at CHEO in Ottawa, uh, every single child who gets diagnosed with cancer and goes through the cancer clinic there, every child meets the pediatric palliative care team, period. Even if they have, you know, a leukemia with a 99% cure rate, they meet the palliative care team. And I think uh, you know, we can't we can't do that in in adults. We can't scale that to adults, right? Because um, we can't meet every like a, a specialist palliative care team can't meet everybody with a life limiting illness. But in pediatrics, because the population is smaller, um, they have the ability to do that. Um, so that's something that could be considered, and I think has been a little bit uh, you know mitigated some of the fears and stigma. Of they the the team comes in and and says you know we see everybody here. It's not it's not you. It's not your prognosis. We see everybody. Here's who we are. We have friendly faces. This is what we do, and they can follow people kind of more or less intensely based on their needs um, and the trajectory of their illness. Um, that's in Chio. I mean, talking in the north, I think. Um, uh, my experiences have been, uh, you know, to to kind of find your people and find your networks, um, like because I think a lot of us, you're right, it's hard to imagine. Or if we're used to seeing adult palliative care and now we're into the realm of pediatric palliative care, we feel out of our element. Um, like uh, just speaking from personal experience of of having cared for a pediatric palliative care patient within the last year, which was at times extremely devastating, of course, and also extremely powerful and meaningful. Um, like I found such a sense of community of people within my community, champions within my community, and champions within Ottawa and champions within Toronto. Like reach out to your network, ask for help. Um, I know this. I got a little bit tangential to the question here, but I don't have any one great tool. But can we uh, can we reduce the inequities? Can we think of it even for all kids with a life limiting illness? Uh, that's a little bit more scalable in that population. Thank you. Uh, another question is: um, How often should a rye be updated? I, I am not sure, Dr. Pun. I, do you know? I think that probably speaks to, you know, if we're thinking of the respect tool, which uses the RI. I mean, the respect tool could easily be updated anytime the person has like a change in their status or a new admission or anything. I know the RI is quite extensive and probably couldn't be uh, uh, updated quite that frequently. But. Yeah, like I, I think to me, I always think of whenever there is a change in, um, the status, whether or a change in the situation, even like, I mean, if a new family member come by um, and they, they kind of seem to have a different perspective, I might even just pull out the tool at that point. So, so I can see it as really one of those things that, you know, again, something in you, whether it's the need, it's mostly the needs of the patient that seems to be changing. That's when I'll pull it up. Well, this is one of the benefits of having such a multidisciplinary conference. We had, uh, you know, four people answer it in the chat, uh, <laughs> which is great. Um, so it looks like uh, we've had a couple of people saying every three months in long-term care, every three months in the community as well, um, or with a change in status. So thanks for that, everybody. 
And Debbie, I was also noted in, in the in the chat about the hug uh, program. It was actually that's the beauty of presenting with two screens. I said I quickly googled it, and then it looks really really great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, definitely a lot of resources. I think as the more we kind of and one of the things I love about conferences like this is that opportunity to connect with other people and resources. Right. But the other thing that kind of I'm taking note for our scientific planning committee is that might be really, I mean, we actually had it potentially as an agenda or as an, as an item for, for the education needs. So for sure, like, I mean, anything that we can seem to have a, a in depth co coverage of, we can definitely put it as the next kind of either, you know, education or, or conference topic. Debbie? Dr. Pun and uh, Dr. Moore for um, their presentation. And we are very thankful to have such passionate people um, in our area working for our clients. Uh, so please go in and complete your evaluation and we will start back at 1 o'clock. And thank you again, Dr. Pun and Dr. Moore. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Debbie.